Good afternoon, OR Today. Thank you for all participating in today's webinar. We are excited to bring this monthly webinar series to the OR Today community. You can see the same caliber of speakers and present presentations at our annual OR Today Live Conference and Expo, which will be held at the Hilton Oak Brook Hills Resort August 28th through the 30th, 2016. You can learn more about this conference by visiting ortodaylive.com. Earlier today, a webinar workbook was emailed to pre-registered attendees. If you did not receive a copy, you can download one now under the handout section of your dashboard. During today's webinar, all lines will be muted, but you can submit questions by using the questions feature on your dashboard. A certificate of attendance for today's webinar can be obtained by completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen immediately following the presentation. If you are having difficulty, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, AAAHC, the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare, AAAHC, is a private, nonprofit organization formed in 1979. AAAHC is the leader in developing standards to advance and promote patient safety, quality care, and value for ambulatory health care through peer-based accreditation processes, education, and research. AAAHC accredits more than 6,000 accredited health care organizations in the U.S. and internationally. A certificate of accreditation is awarded to organizations that are found to be in compliance with AAAHC standards. Learn more about this organization by visiting AAAHC.org. That's AAAHC.org. Our webinar today will feature co-presenters Lori Dice and Chris Kilgore. Chris is the Administrative Director for Grand Rapids Op Ophthalmology Surgical Care Center. She also holds the position of AAAHC Surveyor and Faculty. Lori is the AAAHC Assistant Director of Education and has been a nurse for over 25 years. She has been involved in healthcare education for over 18 years and has over 20 years of experience combining creativity and analytical skills in simulation-based instructional design and delivery for healthcare settings. Ladies, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be um, on this panel today with Chris Kilgore. Um, today we're going to be discussing emergency management in your organization. And to help you understand what we're going to be doing today, we're going to, the objectives are to develop an internal emergency and disaster plan that addresses the risks of your organization, to implement simulation-based training using clinical-based scenarios, and then develop corrective action plans based on an evaluation of your drills to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of emergency management in your workplace. In your environment, a variety of unexpected issues can lead you to emergencies. Uh, rapid response teams or code teams are non-existent non in the ASC environment and they may be limited to some extent in some hospital settings. Responsibility for emergency management relies often on a very lean staff um, wearing multiple hats. So what is simulation-based training for emergencies? Simulation-based training increases the emergency preparedness through deliberate practice using clinically-based scenarios to represent a real-world emergency situation. And this is certainly different than just having an education in service, but it, you're actually going through the skills and the motion of what a real emergency would be like. The benefits of simulation-based training is it helps um, staff assess their internal emergency disaster plan and teams' readiness. And it also allows them to make changes if changes need to be made. It allows for the development and the application of clinical and critical thinking skills. It certainly helps promote team collaboration and communication skills. And most importantly, it facilitates the discovery of broken processes and problem solving through corrective action plans after um, you have done your drills. 
Research also shows that a simulation of emergency situations can effectively prepare organizations for such emergencies and deliberate practice helps ingrain appropriate uh, behaviors. So getting ready. Um, so are you prepared? So in this particular model, you will see that there is many facets to addressing the elements of an emergency management plan. And the first thing begins with what is your internal emergency and disaster plan? And we'll talk a little bit about some organizations customize it. Some organizations purchase a emergency disaster plan, but if you do purchase an emergency disaster plan, make sure that you have customized it to your organization. Staff and physician training and education. Uh, on some drills, such as like malignant hyperthermia, you're going to need to have education and um, training, which is through the drills. So do keep in mind that education and drills are two separate entities. You want to make sure that you have the appropriate uh, equipment, emergency medications and equipment. And often what I find helpful about drills is you find out at that time that a lot of people don't know where the crash cart is. People don't know where the proper medication is. Sometimes there's ways of overriding your ability to get medications. And so you kind of start to think about some of those access to these things during a drill. Simulation-based drills that often are based on a, an actual case is helpful. And then it's really important that you have a debriefing session with your staff so they can help you a little bit with what went well and what did not go well and what needs to be changed. And then certainly you have an evaluation so they can see how that they did. And then you also want to put together a corrective action plan that needs to be implemented pretty timely so that if an emergency in the, of what you had a drill on takes place, you're properly prepared for that. So when beginning with the internal emergency and disaster plan, it's very important that you look at federal, state, and local regulations. I know that there's many state requirements related to certain types of organizations, such as office-based surgery, so you want to make sure you're in compliance with that as well. It's really important that you perform a risk assessment on yourself, um, particularly if you bought a, a, um, a purchased emergency disaster plan. I do remember going on a survey where it was in the state of Illinois and they had hurricane, uh, monthly hurricane um, drills that they were supposed to be performing. So those that's not really applicable in a couple of ways. A, we don't have hurricanes in, in Illinois. And secondly, um, to do them on a monthly basis probably is not necessary. So make sure you know what's in your plan. You want to perform a risk assessment um, and make sure that you're addressing those things that you're at risk for. And then you want to review any existing plan and relevant policies to make sure that they're current with your current practice as well as your staff is aware of what's in those policies. So what types of emergencies should you consider? Well, you certainly want to consider patient factors or pre-existing conditions. If you have patients that are have cardiopulmonary disease or um, predisposition to hypothermia or untreated hypertension, you certainly want to um, be prepared for situations such as that. Uh, medical intervention such as anesthesia or extended procedure time. Facility issues, and these would be things like a fire, power loss, incapacitated staff, um, threatening patients. And then, of course, weather, tornadoes, earthquakes, earthquakes hurricanes, um, we have winter storm issues here in Illinois and, and flooding. So you want to keep all those in mind when you're considering um, what you're going to be doing your drills on. In addition, for the risk assessment, you want to know what roles have been assigned, who, it, what roles have been assigned for emergencies. So often a question we get asked is, does the front desk have to participate in, for example, a CPR drill? Well, who's calling your emergency management team? Who's greeting your emergency management team? Who's responsible for sending the paperwork over to if you're transferring the patient out? So you need to think those things through. Um, what is your chain of command? How do you notify staff of an emergency? Um, this can be a little bit more challenging in ambulatory situations. Um, and also, in addition, if you're in an ambulatory situation, if you are do have an emergency 
your notification of that emergency may extend to other people who you share the building with, so they're aware when a ambulance or fire truck comes to the organization. Do you have an evacuation plan? Have you practiced the evacuation plan? Is it accessible? Do people know where it is? Is your facility equipped to handle fire trucks and ambulances at the point of entry if you are transferring the patient? And that, again, is particularly important in ambulatory because some people have overhead kind of roofs and they found that the ambulance, or they, particularly the fire trucks, can't get through. And then how quickly does your code team or your rapid response team, if you have one, how quickly do they respond and what are your responsibilities up until that team comes? And then what does your handoff look like? So review your existing plans and your policies is, is extremely important. You want to make sure that your risk assessment that you have, a, that you have uh, completed matches your existing plan, and if it doesn't, if you find out you're trending some different risks than when your plan was written, then you need to adapt it to that. And we've already talked about purchase plans versus customized plans. In essence, a purchase plan should eventually become a customized plan to meet your needs. And then make sure you have safe, evacua safe evacuation plans. This really should be part of a new staff member's orientation, and you want to make sure that that you practice those as well, and then you time how long it takes for uh, people to be evacuated. Okay, so here is an example of what an annual calendar of emergency drills, and if you're accredited by a certain accrediting body or even state requirements, they will have standards related to how often you have to have drills. At HHC, we require organizations to do four quarterly drills per year, and we do require one drill to be CPR. If that organization also happens to be um, um, CMS, then the requirement of CMS is that they have to do a quarterly fire drill per year. Now, we don't dictate what kind of additional drills other than our standard requirement is CPR, and CMS requires fire drills. But certainly, if you are giving a triggering agent through anesthesia, you should be doing a malignant hypothermia drill. You should be doing some type of facility drill. A lot of people are doing um, hostile, uh, um, not ho hostile uh, patient or concerned with firearms now that come into your facility. So some people are um, doing drills related to that. Um, so this is just a snapshot to keep everyone in place that even though our standards may say do one CPR drill a year, you also have to measure that against how many employees need that CPR drill. So you may be doing more than one a year, even though our standards only require um, one per year. Um, so this is just a snapshot of the different type of drills that are going on, and this is just a calendar of that, and I think helps keep everybody in, intact a little bit. And then you want to detail the calendar a little bit. So if you're going to do four fire drills per year, maybe you're going to have them in different rooms. You're going to have one in the waiting room, one in the OR room, one in the gas room. Um, that's related to a power loss. So you're kind of doing two drills at once. And maybe one's a pre-procedure room. Um, same with CPR. You can see that it kind of double dipped on an incapacitated physician um, in a CPR drill. So we're, not, we're doing a drill on both of them at the same time. And then again with malignant hypothermia. And then tornado, you want to think about during hours for sure, and then what happens after hours when staff is still there, but you have no patients in the facility. So in addition to this, you also want to be tracking your participants. So it's really important that um, you find you keep a log of who's doing what. It's also really important to figure out from all your staff who needs to be involved in what drills. So this kind of helps um, keep a log of what person needs to do what drill and who's outstanding still needs to do more drills. So this is just a tracking form. Okay, so your, your internal disaster plan, as we talked about already, is customized to the needs of the organization. You develop the yearly calendar of drills that we've already shown. Each participant for each drill is identified, the data has been assigned, and then you ha have it tracked in your personnel file. 
And it's very helpful to do all these tasks before um, the, the beginning of the year, so you kind of have a plan of who needs to do what. Okay. Training and education, you definitely need, as I emphasized, check with your state requirements on what this means. Um, each state is very different. I already emphasized that training and education are different um, than drills. Training and education are the theory and the knowledge, and the drill is the actual application of this. So a lot of times we will hear organizations say, we have the local fire department come out and show us how to use a fire extinguisher. Does that count as a drill? You know, that would fall under education and training. Um, you, in order for it to be a drill, they, it would have to be a case-related situation. Um, you may still look at using fire extinguishers and how to use it, but it needs to be in a case-based scenario where other activities are involved, not just one activity. Um, CPR training is dependent on the risk of the patient. Often these, often these risks are dependent on the age of the patient, the level of anesthesia, and the invasiveness of the procedure. If you're in an organization that you expect your staff to be ACLS or PEL certified, then often you're going to be following those protocols. And then the participants who attend, as we already talked about, depends on the job description. But please don't forget about the clinical personnel because they often are the ones that are kind of coordinating the care as far as the emergency management team and helping with handoffs. Okay, um, medications and equipment. Again, check with state requirements. I know, for example, the state of Florida with office-based settings, they have very strict, strict requirements related to what's on their crash cart. Um, and so it's really important, again, look at your state requirements, but make sure that your equipment is up and running, that it's working, that your staff knows where it is. Um, if you're doing malignant hypothermia drills and you have expired dantrolene, it's great to use that for practicing for your drills because it, it, it's uh, you almost see a full-time person that's drawing up the dantrolene. Um, it's also important that you look inside your crash cart and make sure you don't have outstanding or expired medications. We often see that. We always, if we're going to find expired medications, often it is on your crash cart. You want to make sure your AED um, has the battery is working. You also want to make sure that if your AED requires pediatric pads or if you have a pedi pediatric or infant population, you do have those pads available. You also can write your, uh, whoever, in this picture looks like Philips is their vendor for the AED, you can write Philips and get um, practice pads to use during a drill. And if you can have access to your AED in a practice mode, it's really helpful for staff to see how long it takes to wait for it to be prompted. I think that's important because in an emergency, um, time really seems to be very slow. So this is just an example of some of the equipment that you need. And Chris, I believe this is where I turn it over to you, correct? Yes. Hello? Go ahead. OK. Um, I, too, would like to uh, thank all of you for joining the webinar. And I get the fun part now. I get to tell you all the things, just some helpful hints. And I'm telling this to you as a surveyor, as an administrator of an ambulatory surgery center, and um, through things I've seen out in the real world as I do my surveys. So I'm going to try to give you some examples and some helpful hints. So one of the things that, that is really critical are the drills. You know, we all talk about we're doing drills, but really, truly, the goal that we all have is keeping our patients safe, keeping our employees safe, and just having a safe work environment. So in your drills, use real-world scenarios. Make drills fun. Have everybody on the staff participate. Make sure that you assign different staff people to help with the drills. Come up with a, a scenario that is truly based on what's going to happen within or may happen within your organization. Identify your roles. So maybe on a staff meeting, you want to have everybody walk into the staff meeting, give them a slip of paper that tells them what role they're playing for that day, and actually act out the, the role as far as assign someone to be the anesthesia provider, assign someone to be the doctor, and do your actual drill. 
because what you'll find when you do the drill is, like Lori said, what process is broken? What equipment don't we have? How easy is it to blanket roll or um, carry a patient down a stairwell that has had some sedation? So you really have to think about those things. And the only way to come up with corrective action plans is to actually do the drill. So again, you want to develop a plan. Make sure everybody knows the drill and how to do it. Make sure you've done in-servicing, especially upon um, employment, orientation, and again, annually. Make sure that everybody knows how we're going to do with the drill, how we would handle an emergency situation. Also, use an evaluation tool. That's the only way to provide feedback, which would include time. How long did it take us to make sure all our rooms were clear in the event of a fire? Go back and evaluate the process because there's no way to know how well you're doing or how well things are going if you don't do an evaluation. The key, too, is to debrief your staff. After you go through the drill scenario, talk about, hey, what do you guys think went well? What didn't? What could we do better? What things do we need that would make it easier for, for you to carry out an emergency situation? And then create and implement the corrective action plan. And Again, once you identify a problem, you need to, to come up with a corrective action plan immediately. It's pretty hard to wait three weeks, a month. If you find out there's something missing or your equipment, the batteries are bad on a battery backup, make sure that you identify those things and take care of them right away. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, CPR. We're going to talk about the different drills. Um, this is just an example of how you could set up the identification of roles within your facility. Make sure that you look through your facility and what kind of emergency equipment do you have in the event that you needed to do uh, a code blue or whatever you identify it as. So you're going to need a facilitator. That's the person that's going to plan your drill. They'll carry around the clipboard to evaluate the drill. They're going to help develop that corrective action plan and debrief the staff. Usually this is the administrator or maybe the clinical nurse manager, or it may even be a member of the medical staff or anesthesia provider. Then you need a runner. Get some emergency, who's going to get that emergency equipment? Maybe you assign it to the circulator. Maybe it's the um, pre-op nurse. But you need to know who's going to be responsible for getting the equipment. And make sure that you don't name the people, but probably the role that they play as far as a circulator or as far as pre-op nurse. That way, if someone's on vacation when an event happens or you're doing a drill, you know who's going to provide the role. You also need that runner to help direct patient flow and gather additional items. That's usually your support staff. It could be your nursing assistant. It could be your receptionist. It could be your purchasing person that's on site. There's various people that you're going to tap into that can help you perform um, the drill or in case of a true emergency. You have to have a team leader, someone that's going to give the orders and direct the team and that activates that plan. This is usually someone that's um, in the medical staff, might be anesthesia. Uh, occasionally you'll see a nurse administrator or clinical nurse that may do this as well. Then you've got to have your responder, your BCLS, your ACLS PALS, Whoever is trained and knows how to use the AED, knows the CPR algorithms, and this again is the nursing um, and medical staff, and don't forget to include your anesthesia providers. And the key, another key role is who's going to document? Who's documenting that drill? Who's recording the times and the sequence of events? And that can be any staff member that you've chosen to do that. And then the communicator. Who communicates the emergency to others in the facility and, or the building? Who's gathering the patient's charts and the face sheet? Who's knowing what patient's family members is in the waiting room and to make sure that those um, people are also notified of what's going on? Um, who's greeting that emergency team? One of the things that happened within our organization is um, the way we're located in our building, and, and Lori talked a little bit about this, is when we did a true drill and had the fire department actually come out with our big fire truck, we found that when both sides of the parking lot were um, full with cars, the fire truck couldn't get around. It couldn't make the corner. So we actually had to direct them around the other way um, around the building. 
So one of the things we talked about in our drill is we need to make sure we've got someone stationed outside to direct the fire uh, personnel so that if they do have to go around, they know the, the easiest way to enter the building, the fastest way. Um, think about your stairwells. How are you going to get patients up and down? What about your emergency equipment? Your, um, if you've got sedated patients, do you know that all your monitors, that the batteries are functioning, and that how long does the charge on those pieces of equipment? How do you know who's within your facility to make sure everybody's outside? Have you identified a place where everybody can, can go and gather to make sure everybody's accounted for? So you really have to think about some of the things that are going to happen, and that's why drills are so key. Next slide, please. And, and I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but on again, you're going to identify roles in the event of a fire. And again, who's planning the drill? Who's evaluating that drill? So you've got to have that facilitator. When you're doing a, a fire drill, again, make this a drill that changes, that's evolving. Don't always have your drill happen in the OR. Perhaps it's going to happen in the autoclave room. Maybe it's going to happen in pre-op area. But make sure your drills vary so that you identify all the areas where there could be a problem that needs to be fixed. And I've uh, heard some centers that do what they call the teddy bear drill, where they actually buy a red teddy bear, and they will place that somewhere within the organization. That is the starting point of the fire. Whoever finds that teddy bear calls out the beginning of the drill, and that's the point it starts. And then um, that staff person either gets to keep the bear, or they're the one that plans the next drill. So make the drills fun, get everybody involved. Um, when you're looking at this type of a drill, also the runner, you're going to have to think about the different emergency equipment you need with a fire. Um, fire extinguisher, are you going to get one, or is the fire big enough that you're going to say, nah, -uh, we, this is our policy. We do close the doors, get everybody out, and, and we evacuate. So you really need to look at where the fire is, how involved it is, and what kind of equipment we're going to actually use, or do we just evacuate. Again, you always, it's key that you have a team leader. You have to have one person in charge that's giving the orders and that's directing the team. Make sure that all your employees know your race or whatever terminology you want to use to how you evacuate and what you do in the event of that fire. And again, you've got your different responders who are going to assist with your evacuation plan. And that's, you know, whatever staff that you have at that time, make sure they're all involved. Again, you need someone that's documenting the drill and the timing. I think timing is important. I think you need to know how long did it take us to make sure all of our rooms were clear and all of our patients and family members were out of this building. How long was the whole building evacuated? And who's going to notify other members within our building that we're having a, that there is a fire? What is the mode of communication and who's responsible? One of the other things to think about is, how do I know who's within my building? How do I know who's within my surgery center or my uh, hospital setting, you know, wherever you're coming from? How do you know at any given time who's in the building? Make sure that that surgery schedule, the check-in sheet, time card record, whatever it is, make sure that goes out with you as well, and you've identified a place where you're all going to meet so you can make sure everybody is safe. Next slide, please. And again, this is this is um, something that's when you're when you're doing your drill is make sure you gather your supplies, so you know what symbol or code word you're going to use in the event of an emergency. You know, code red, code blue, code brown, or do we use some other type of word? And I can't um, speak strongly enough. I think to pay attention to what's happening out in the world today, and. I think the biggest thing that we're seeing as surveyors is how many centers now are doing violence in the workplace, whether it be an employee, a family member of an employee, a disgruntled patient. We're seeing more and more drills that are being done for how do we handle violence in the workplace. I'm from the state of Michigan. We have a lot of uh, people that are now carrying concealed weapons. And how do you know and what are, how are you taking care of if someone comes in with a, with a gun? 
and they've got a license to carry concealed weapon. Do you have on your door, is it posted um, that, that they're not allowed to enter? I mean, those are things that today we have to start thinking about. Do you have an emergency plan for if something's happening in your waiting room? How do the rest of you know what's going on in the, in the back and maybe in the pre-op or in the recovery area in the ORs? So you really need to make sure that you're looking at how you're going to identify an emergency and let everybody know of that. Um, again, when you're gathering your supplies and you're going to do your drills, make sure you, you, you can use, like the slide says, a fake patient. Assign one of your staff members to be the patient. It's pretty hard to carry out a drill when you're, when you're trying to work. Usually it's done during a staff in-service and you assign different roles to everybody. But truly do that and let everybody get an opportunity to play a different role within the drill. And again, check your emergency um, equipment and medications. Go through your crash cart. Look at your medications. How do you mix those medications? Have some cheat sheets that say, if we're going to use this medication, this is, this is how we mix it. And make sure all those supplies are right there with that medication. Um, usually on the top of the crash cart, I'm seeing that um, places will put in the ACLS, the little uh, cards that you get when you take ACLS, so that in the event that you need to use it, it's right there. It tells you the proper protocol and plan that you need. Make sure that you look at the, the um, cords on your suction equipment, that your portable suction. How long is that cord? Is it long enough to reach a plug in the event that you need it? Do you have your oxygen tank? Is it working properly? So those are all the things that you really want to be checking out as you gather your supplies and you do your drill. Next slide. So now we're going to stage the scenario. So we're going to put the patient or symbol identifying where that emergency is going to take place. And again, make the drills fun. You can use a uh, picture of a fire. You can use the teddy bear. You can use a red flashing light. Whatever you want to do to identify that this is where the, the um, drill is going to start. Or what you may want to do is on a piece of paper, write out, today we're doing this case and all of a sudden the drape catches on fire. What do we do now? So you can read the scenario, you can place a symbol, but start the scenario and then provide the instructions to the staff about what your expectations are. This is key that everybody knows this is what we do in the event of this type of drill. If you're going to role play, give everybody a name tag so everybody knows what role they're playing today. And again, provide the storyline of the emergency if that's appropriate. Or maybe if you're going to use something and, and wherever that is found, that's where the uh, drills start. However you want to do it. And then the facilitator needs to call out the sequence of events. This is what's happening now. Where do we go from here? And you need to have a definite stop and start time of your drill. So you know the start time is pretty easy. It's going to be whenever they find the symbol or whatever you're using. but what is the stop time? How long did it take us to clear, to clear out our facility? How long did it take us to evacuate all of our patients and family and staff? You really need to know and time the steps because that may lead to some corrective action plans. Next slide. These are just some examples. These are, um, um, you guys all have these handouts, so these are just some some ways that you may want to do it, and, and it's a good example, but tailor it to your own center. So this scenario is you've got a 72-year-old diabetic man with a history of COPD. They're in the recovery room after cataract surgery. The patient's surgery was uneventful, and the patient received 2 milligrams of Versed IV for sedation prior to surgery. You've still got your IV in, and these are your vital signs. So this is the start of my drill. The nurse performing the second post-op check. Once the code starts, the facilitator observes and evaluates. So now this is, this is my scenario. So my blood pressure has dropped, my pulse is, is increasing, my respirations and um, O2 sat. So after two minutes, the facilitator um, is stating the patient codes and is unresponsive. So what are we going to do? You're going to do four rounds of CPR, patients intubated, the AED. So this is kind of how you would pro provide your scenario is, okay, this is what's happening, now what do we do? And for any of you that have taken ACLS or PALS, this is kind of the, how they do the mega codes. So think of it in that terms is, what do we do from here? Who's going to do what? And make sure you know who's leading the drill. 
Next slide. And here could be an example of, a, of the starting of a fire. You've got a 45-year-old female with no significant medical or surgical history. She's been prepped for lipo um, surgery of the abdomen by the nurse who performed an alcohol, keyword there, surgical prep on the patient. The patient is draped. Timeout is performed. Surgeon begins to cauterize the patient and the abdomen lights on fire. The patient is receiving oxygen via nasal cannula. So now we're going to start this drill with fire on the abdomen. The end of our drill is going to be the evacuation of the patient to safety. So you're going to go through all the steps of what do we do and actually role play this so you know what are we going to do. Because you can talk about it and talk about it, but until you actually go through the motions, you cannot figure out what do I need to correct or hey, we all did a great job, wonderful. I will tell you that as a surveyor, one of the things we do see is um, we will see people that are still continuing to do paper drills only. And it's very obvious that they're paper drills because they say the same thing every time. Staff all knew what to do. We had a great drill. Please do more than a paper drill. Do an actual drill where you're role playing because in the event of an emergency, you do want everybody to be informed of everything they need to do to keep everybody safe. So it is just critical today that we do true drills where we role play, we act it out, and, and we do staff education for things we need help on, good job for things that you've done well, and where do we go from here? What plan of correction can we do that involves the whole team to help us do better the next time? Next slide. This is just a tool that you could use as an evaluation tool for and corrective action plan. So you talk about the drill, who was involved, checklist of events, kind of what happened, did we debrief everybody, um, who was facilitating this, and, and after we debriefed, what do we need to do better? What did we do great? What do we need to do better? And it may be simple as we didn't have this medication, or when we opened the crash cart, we found out this medication was expired, or the battery on our AED um, was not working, so we need to make sure we're checking that battery and, and logging that. I mean, those are the kinds of things that you may find that it's simple, but critical, or it may be something big, and it's like, oh my gosh, we never thought of this. What do we do different next time? Then you're going to have a date on there when you're going to complete that corrective action plan, and how is it communicated to everybody. Make sure that you inform everybody, and that's from physicians, anesthesia, staff, how do we communicate, when did we do it, and uh, next time we do the drill, make sure that all those things are in place. Next slide. Okay, so again, we're debriefing our staff. Um, the people that are involved in the drill are the best people to know what went well, what do we need to improve upon, and I, I really feel that the sooner you can talk about everything, the better it is. The more information you're going to gain because it's real and it's fresh in everybody's mind. So how do, what suggestions do you have to improve the process? I mean, you may find that even the receptionist who had to take care of calling everybody, alerting everybody, getting the fire department there, she may have some great ideas on, hey, this would really help me. Um, then again, it's completed usually by the facilitator, and it's who's ever running that drill. You might need 10 minutes, maybe longer, to get feedback. Um, usually feedback happens right away. I mean, people, if there's an issue, are usually quick to tell you that. Here are some sample questions to elicit some information. You know, how do you think it went? Positives and negatives. I mean, it's so easy to think negative, but let's think about the positives as well. Um, work together as a team. What was working well? What could we improve? And what do you guys think we could do next time? What kind of a scenario do you think we could face that would help us and help you? Compliment everybody. People love to hear the positives. Make sure that you tell everybody that did a great job, that they did a great job, and what about their job was great. And then incorporate suggestions into your corrective action plan. And don't forget about anesthesia. Anesthesia usually has some great ideas of how can we do things better. And they're the ones that usually are in every area and, and can 
um, provide some valuable insight. Next slide, please. And again, you're going to do those corrective actions immediately, as soon as you can. You know, you may have to order a new battery. You may have to order some more medication. But it's critical that you do it right away. Because as Lori said, you certainly don't need want to have run through a drill and next week you have a true emergency and you didn't correct the things that you found were problems. So you need a timeline of events for implementation of that corrective action. When are we going to get this done? Let's be realistic. What how much time is it going to take? Is it a budget thing where we need to get this approved by the board? And if it's a critical issue, it may need to be a board meeting that we've got to do a telephone conference because we need to get this approved. And again, communicate to the staff, the physicians, and the governing body any changes in your process or any practices that you need to change based on the outcome of your drill. Because everybody is there for safe patient care, safe care of your employees and your facility. Next slide. Um, one thing before we open up to questions I just want to say too is when you identify some of the, the processes and the problem areas, one of the things you might want to think about is can I make this corrective action plan into a QI study? Always be looking for things that you need to correct where you can say, hey, this is a great QI study. It's involving everybody. How do I make this into a study that's going to show improvement that I can remeasure later? And um, if there's more issues, I can do some um, additional corrective actions. So always be thinking about, can I do and can I make a, a quality improvement study out of this? Very good. Well, thank you so much uh, for that great presentation. We did have a few questions come through uh, while the presentation was taking place. We're going to go ahead and ask those now, but we want to remind the audience that if you do have any questions, feel free to submit them now through the questions feature on your dashboard. Uh, but we'll go ahead and begin with the ones we have. Uh, the first question, recently we had a patient code in our waiting room. Fortunately, the patient survived. Can we count this experience as a drill? Chris, uh, I will go ahead and take this question. So if you had a, a real uh, emergency, you certainly, as long as you have someone that's document, documenting the course of action, you can certainly count that as a, a drill. You should have an evaluation piece to it, and you should have a debriefing session with your staff and you should make any corrective actions um, that you make to the or to this emergency if you made anything that you learned along the way and you want to make sure that you communicate that to your staff um, effectively but if it is I can't emphasize enough it is, if it is a real emergency um, you definitely want to make sure that you do debrief the staff within a 24-hour period um, as well but yes, you can count that as long as you have an evaluation piece and you have a corrective action piece um, if needed to that uh, particular situation. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question. Every year we have a fire department come to our facility and actually practice using fire extinguishers. Does this count as a drill? I'll, t I'll take this one. Um, no, it does not count as a drill. That counts as staff education. And let me tell you, I think it is so valuable to do that. Um, we do that on an annual basis as well in our center. And it, it is amazing um, how scared everyone is to actually touch the fire extinguisher. But this truly is part of staff education and is a great way to keep everybody um, familiar and comfortable in the event that an emergency did take place. The other thing you can do, um, sometimes I've had the fire department actually work with me after we've done the education piece. I've worked with them to actually stay the drill. And so I've done that also with when I've had um, people come out and teach uh, the CPR course that uh, as follow-up we've actually staged a drill after um, it's occurred. So you can, you can combine the two together, but as Chris has said, um, Training, training and education and drills are separate entities, but you can combine them all together if you follow up with a drill. 
And and I will say one of the other things today is again, you know, we're seeing um you know, violence in the workplace and we um we're seeing more and more as surveyors where kind of the same thing. Organizations are involving their local police departments to come in and to do an assessment of their facility to say in the event of somebody within your workplace, this is how you would evacuate, this is how you would keep everybody as safe as possible, this is how you would diffuse the situation. So certainly look at members of your community that would provide this service to you as an organization. Um, because they want to do that. They're about educating. And so really reach out to the members of your community that might be able to help you um, do your drills and your education for staff. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question, can you explain how to relay the fire alert to the monitoring station and record that time frame? Doesn't CMS require this? Did, would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, go ahead and repeat the question. I want to make sure I understand it. Yeah. Sure. Can you explain how to relay the fire alert to the monitoring station and record that time frame? Doesn't CMS require this? Did you want to take that, Chris? Well, um, I, you know, I'm thinking on that one. And within our organization, um, we have our security system monitors all that. So the minute that we would pull our alarm, it is recording because not only would we call the fire department, um, the alarm company does as well. So we could get a record from them of actual timing. CMS, I'm, I can't answer that 100%. I, Lori, do you know the answer to CMS? No, they require I, don't, that? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I can certainly check and get back, um, but I don't know the answer off my head. That isn't something that, that I'm familiar with. Yeah, I've not I've not heard of that, but that does not mean that it's not a CMS requirement. But certainly, I would check with my um, who's ever doing my building security or your security system. Is there a way that once that fire alarm is pulled or whatever your uh, process is for notifying um, the fire department, do they keep a log of that as well? Um, because then you could put that into your policy that if you need to, you could obtain that information from them them as well. Internally, you could also start monitoring, you know, this is when we pulled the alarm, this is when the fire department arrived or whatever it is. So you could internally know that as well. But I'm sure that your alarm company um, monitors all that and can tell you that by the minute. Excellent. Thank you for that. Our last question here, does our administrative and front desk staff need to participate in drills? So I can go ahead and take that. Um, it really depends on, you know, what the situation is. But I would think in most situations, you want everyone involved in an emergency. As Chris um, clearly went over, there's many different roles that are involved. And not all the roles are clinical. So things like runner, um, the person who, you know, would be at the front desk that would greet the emergency management team or the fire department. Um, that person's also, the front desk is also involved with um, printing up the paperwork. You also have administrators or other folks, uh, even if they're in the business office, that may be helping with diverting other patients um, away from the emergency as a staff tending to the emergency. So I think it's always helpful to involve um, as many people as possible to, to some degree and, and provide them a role that they're capable of doing. Um, I think that's really the best thing to do. And, and when you role play, think about what, were, what would happen if you had a code situation in your waiting room, in your reception area. The, the one that we have had within our center, that is where it occurred. It was a family member in the reception area. So the receptionist does need to know in our situation 
what do I do? What do I do next? So I do think it's valuable to assign a role to that person and at least so everybody knows what the protocol is in the event of this type of an emergency. And yeah, especially, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with you, Chris, because I think my under, my my understanding of working with staff is that the ancillary staff, like the clinical staff for the administrative staff or business office, they want to actually kind of be involved so that they are prepared in case they would be the first person um, that would possibly find the patient or find the fire that you you don't you can't predict how that's going to go. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lori and Chris, and thank you for today's uh, sponsor, Triple HC. Visit aaahc.org for more information on this presentation. Attendees, remember to obtain your certificate of attendance. You will need to submit the post-webinar survey, which will appear momentarily. Again, if you are having trouble, email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Please visit ortoday.com forward slash webinars to register for our next presentation, which will be on December 3rd, sponsored by the Competency and Credentialing Institute. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.